Sumit sir, Vijay sir, Advocate Nishant is already switched on. And Farina is also there with us. Good evening, Namaste, and welcome. This is the virtual knowledge sharing platform of Vivekananda. It's been 67 days of thousands of gadgets, and now we are in the unlocked phase one. But one thing I have to be consistent no more on education. Hey, whatever had happened, she got out the bat. That's again in the debatable column. But we here at Wake and the Global University have been short and have left no stone unturned to ensure that education doesn't stop, learning doesn't stop. Students get what they deserve and, in fact, have been receiving whatever maximum they could have in this tough phase. Prices always come with opportunity. And we have been discussing that in all the other programs we have been doing. A very quick glimpse if I give you to what we have done so far. More than 300 plus webinars, around 500 experts from across the globe. You name it and we have done it all. From re-engineer to managers for new normal, to science talks to agriculture, scenario post-COVID, and now we are today about to roll on the law econ claim, conceptualized and promoted by the Department of Law, School of Law, Wakananda Global University. Amidst the wonderful panelists, can I request my tech team to help me introduce the panelists? Today, with the wonderful panel, which I'll be just uh, introducing to you all, we have with us on screen Dr. Vijay Tiwari. Dr. Vijay Tiwari is the Associate Professor of Law, Maharashtra National Law University, Nagpur. Dr. Vijay Tiwari has done his LLM in Constitutional Law. And human rights from postgraduate teaching department of law, University of Nagpur, and PhD in the area of medical negligence and consumer protection from NLU Jodhpur. He started his teaching career from NLU Jodhpur and have the experience of teaching in both government and private law schools. He was also the principal at integrated law school, Gazeba, as an associate professor at law at Vekananda. Institute of Professional Studies, New Delhi. He's the head for Center of Children's Rights. He's also a convener of Moot Court, an internship committee in Maharashtra National Law University. Welcome, sir. Next on the panel, we are very delighted to have been joined by one of very senior advocates, advocate Mr. Sumit Chandar. Uh, Mr. Sumit Chandar is the advocate supreme and Delhi High Court. He's practicing lawyer at the Delhi High Court and Supreme Court of India. He has graduated in law from Kurukshetra University and got enrolled with the Bar Council of Delhi in year 2002. His expertise is in civil, commercial and constitutional cases and he had five PPIL which resulted in establishment of 18 courts and 22 commercial courts in Delhi. He's frequently invited as a legal expert on various news channels such as India News, Adstock, NDTV, to name a few. He's a mediator with the Delhi High Court Mediation, Mediation Center and has been accredited in the commercial mediation by the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. Mr. Sumit Chandar has also been appointed as an arbitrator in various commercial matters by the High Court of Delhi and he was awarded the National Law Award by Dr. Justice K. G. Balakrishnan, former Chief Justice of the arbitration so on and so forth thank you so much Mr. Sumit, for joining us today next on the panel is advocate Tanvi Dube advocate Tanvi Dube is an advocate at Supreme Court of India and is currently practicing with Shardul Amartan Mangladasan company advocate Tanvi Dube specializes in dispute resolution and arbitration and has extensive experience in handling contractual corporate and commercial disputes across a diverse range of sectors. 
She was also fortunate to start a career under the mentorship and guidance of late Sri Ram Jait Malani. Her experience includes appearing before the Supreme Court of India, Delhi High Court, Madhya Pradesh High Court, NCLAT, and the National Green Tribunal. She is a member of the Supreme Court Bar Association and is also a member of the London Court of International Arbitration since 2012. During her law school days, she has interned with various senior advocates and has various publications in her credit. She is one of the youngest panelists to be invited by the University of Oxford and London School of Economics to speak on the issue concerning to women empowerment. Well, welcome, Dr. Uh, advocate Andy Dubey. Next on the panel with us is Advocate Nishant Shekhar Mishra. Advocate Nishant Shekhar Mishra is a practicing advocate at Lucknow Bench, Allahabad High Court and Director, Nexus Legal Associates, partner at Civitex House for ADR and author of various legal books. He has passed this law in the year 2015 and opted advocacy as a profession and as fashion. He fought for the rights of trans Genders, children going to the government primary schools, minor prostitutes, paternal rights, etc. In the due course of time, he has won the I Lead India Award from Times of India, World Peace Prize from Just Prudentia. In this very span of time, he has also gotten 5,000 laws to welcome our Next on the panel is Mr. Parana Joshi. Mr. Parana Joshi is currently a special judicial magistrate. NI Act is a university. Practicing contended examination of Rajasthan judicial services. He has successfully completed his career institutional training at Rajasthan State Judicial Academy, Jodhpur, and was posted as the special judicial magistrate at the last. From last year, he has been serving on the same post. Very delighted to have been joined by such a wonderful and diversified panel. At the outset, I would also like to congratulate
the moment we will deform will deform immediately we got the fast to travel first by car and then by flight and uh, similarly up government wanted everybody to i registered in their website who are they traveling so this is the e governance without physically moving out of my house we have got the pass to travel from maharashtra to delhi similarly this facility should be extended to the different walks of life all those which are needed for people uh, firstly i wish to talk about the advantages of this uh, facility governments first of all it saves time we need not to travel the moment we need not to waste our time in going and finding out the offices where they are we just be in our house fill the form or complete the requirement and we can get the necessity service from the government then it says money we are not going to the outside we are not expending in traveling when we go somewhere we definitely spend in some eating some tea and also in eastern up and most of the parts are from cigarettes we are saving that money we are not crowding the society then we are getting the transparent services which is very very essential for a good governance of the country we are getting efficient services then the government is accountable if every formality has been completed online they do not have any option to keep the paper pending automatically the reply comes to us and the our job is done and uh, then it's a responsible government so these are the benefits of the e governance my dear friends every good thing i'll just take two minutes i'm i'm in the in the finishing it listen every good thing thing some something bad with, with it it has got certain disadvantages also our people are not so educated it's a very difficult for a person like me also to fill the forms i was not able to downsize the photograph and my certificates and hence there some difficulty of course contacted people then of course uh, it is uh, uh, cheap for some people at the same time it is against the income of others rickshaw wala auto wala taxi wala swa chai wala pan wala they are losing their income and the greatest disadvantage is that cyber crime our personal data can be hacked by the people and they can be misused so these are the uh, disadvantages government of india was aware way back in 1974 when they established national information center it was 76 and they are working for providing e governance services for basically four people c to g government to government c to c that is government to citizen c to b government to business g to e government to employees and they have tried to take lot of initiatives which uh, we shall be uh, knowing in the, a little uh, uh, after some time uh now i think i should stop let it is there so you can go to the next panel is it thank you so much sir for very simplistically as i said uh, you know you began with uh, let letting everyone understand that what does these two terms mean and uh, you know very rightfully you can text at the current times as well and you have also touched upon the uh, the very basic advantages or disadvantages of these two words uh coming to the uh, next panelist the very senior advocate with us uh, from the uh, supreme court in delhi high court and you know i mean have been uh, uh, connected to almost uh, everything possible to the indian judicial system uh, advocate sumit tandan sir so from your perspective what does these two terms means and uh, how ready are we to accept these two thank you first of all thank you to vivekanand global university and their young team i think you guys are wonderful and very wonderfully you organized this program coming to your question nitin the era where technology has become a necessity to avail access to justice even before this lockdown we had delhi high court did a few did have a few categories of cases such as commercial cases arbitration cases company cases etc that were filed through e filing but that too was along with the hard copy this is not enough the entire judicial system today has to go through a complete shift and make our legal system totally digital however why judiciary is making these changes happen i believe it must keep in mind three fundamental principles which was rightly said by justice chandra chur also one technology should help enhance the access to justice to the common man not to curb it due to lack of facilities two 
technology should become an intrinsic element of the rule of law and lastly while this change is happening justice should not just become a sovereign function with the use of technology but it should become a service to the society by keeping these fundamental principles in mind we must adopt technology in our present judicial system but trust me technology is properly used it can be it make everyone have access to a faster remedy in law and much easier people can come to their immediate petition using their digital signatures and get it verified by their lawyers you who can use their digital signatures a system of digital notarization can be evolved it's not very difficult once the filing is done the parties no matter to which part of country or live they can attend the hearing online through video conference in case any document or judgment needs to be filed it can be emailed and brought up before the court through email or the chat window of that video conference app so there are various uh, ways and means out of it now imagine what a boon it could be if these things actually become a reality and which is in the process of becoming a reality interestingly to a great extent this has already started happening I have already done a hearing through video conferencing during this lockdown before the Honorable Delhi High Court. The question is: Are the district courts, tribunals, and the smaller small courts, courts in various parts of the country, are they all equipped with this new system? Are the judges comfortable reading a PDF file on their screen and bookmark them as they would in a physical file? Are the court staff trained enough to make the white folders and filing systems in their computers and keep a backup? There's a lot of training that needs to be done across the country, both in the bar and also in the bench. Do you know that government, in consultation with the judiciary, has already started the e-seva kendras across the country? They are now being set up in every district court, which will be a single stop for all requirements of online filing, such as purchasing the stamp papers, e-filing, etc. so even people who don't have access to the technology can visit these e seva kendras and through their online file and this is not enough because this is just initial stage but we need these e seva kendras in every nook and corner of the country so similarly for example the limitation the issues will come up limitations in filing how will they be taken up i like to bring to your notice article 3 of the limitation act article 3 talks about the bar of limitation a subject to the provisions contained in section 4 it says every suit instituted appeal preferred and the application made after the prescribed period shall be dismissed so there is a bar no doubt but it also says that the limitation ends when the plaint is presented before the proper officer has the proper officer been defined anywhere these are the challenges this needs to change the definitions need to be taken up in terms of using the technology similarly article 5 talks about of the limitation act talks about the power to condone in certain cases now it deals with the condemnation of delay in filing of appeals more particularly and it says that the extension of prescribed period in certain cases that any appeal or any application may be admitted even after the prescribed period if the appellant or the applicant satisfies the court that he had sufficient cause for not preferring the appeal or making the application within such period but this word sufficient cause which is a very important phrase in the section it depends on the discretion of the court so the court must be satisfied that this delay is caused due to a genuine reason so even if it is on a online filing and you are having a genuine reason the courts can condone this delay the provision is already there but yes not defined specifically for e filing situation now so far as the present lockdown is concerned the delhi high court in on 23 march and even the supreme court had passed an order saying that the lockdown or the suspension of work of the courts shall be treated as closure within the meaning and explanation of section 4 so the courts have by way of this uh order and judgments have made it very clear that this period of the lockdown will be taken care of in the limitation but 
this is only for a limited period today we are looking for amendments by the legislature to define the new limitations and procedures in filing the case is the e court that are now to become a new normal in our i hope that satisfies your question right definitely uh, you know i mean thank you so much advocate so much for throwing the light on the topic and the uh, you know helping us all understand that definitely e court would be a part of the new normal as we move forward uh bringing me to advocate tanvi uh so you know uh, that some of the world to talk about the subject that uh, you know technology should be leveraged to take in the best benefit for the uh, benefit of common man and uh, you know it should uh, should definitely uh, be a tool for the advancement of the law by whole india and bharat you know if if i categorically talk about these two terminology what is your understanding of these two words courts and e governance right thanks nitin and uh, your discussion in these challenging days i think it's not a, not only a platform in which we interact but it's a very good platform in which we get uh, connected and also discuss these issues which are really important essential because there's a lot of uh, unclarity on these basic aspects there's, every day we find a new circular every day we find a new news so there's a lot of confusion and commotion amongst everyone regarding the e filing and e functioning of the courts so as sir has explained uh, beautifully regarding uh, the e courts uh, a little more to reflect i think in the post covid days if you feel that if you uh, see the scenario this is the shift that's going to take place uh, in the lawyering there ha- they will be e lawyering there will be uh, online functioning of the courts and there are certain important things that we will uh, that will be gradually becoming the new normal and uh, i personally feel that you know these times are not only teaching us how to handle the pandemic situation but also we should look afterwards as the topic is uh, we are looking at the journey of 2020 2025 but the uh, if you are adopting the technology as a model it's not only for the current scenario it should be adopted as a new normal for the generations to come and for that of course the first the primary thing that has to be taken care of is internet connectivity secondly awareness because if you see people are not aware there's only there was a re- i was reading the other day that only 16 to 17 percent lawyers who are totally aware about this technology no one knows how to there's a lot of difficulty in uploading pdfs and even using these uh, online websites for uploading documents to reading of uh, files online so there's a lot of a totally technological shift that people will witness so these are certain important areas which we need to work on the most important area which i personally feel is the uh, websites being updated so we have more than around 17000 courts in india so it's not only the apex courts website that we are looking into we are looking at the website of all the subordinate courts the high courts and there are courts in which the websites are not updated you see the cause list you see the case status you see the judgments that daily updated on regular basis so that is the prime thing that has to be done even if i feel is the best thing and have a look on the board uh, all that is the primary issue that has to be handled it is a little negative people don't have lawyers that still use uh, they are not the technology they use the connectivity that is related to their mobile phones so provision of laptops provision of computers and also every should have at least a room that something of computer so that is the e seva that has there have been introduced that's a very good step that has been taken and i think promotion of the promotion of this education of students all things are important even to before this starting topic i think we should uh, treat this uh, as a new normal and start working in this direction i think that will help everyone uh, to understand the function of the courts and then of course it has to be adopted even more systematic that's what my opinion is right definitely so whatever we are talking the uh, you know the concept and how we are going to is the really the
वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू using of information and communication government process e codes it is something incorporating e governance in code procedures it is a very simple topic and if we have to talk about just the dictionary meaning it is like we are using the information and communication technology in the code procedures now comes the terms of challenges first of all i'd like to take everybody to the history of uh, e codes like uh, what tanvi ma'am was talking about what sumit sir has said about what we just have said about i'll take you to the history of e codes and the history of indian judiciary since 2005 a e committee has been established in india and since then in the paper of 2005 e committee has uh, proposed that something should be done so that the uh, judicial system can be uh, elevated to the digital mode as soon as that report was submitted uh, the then mr chief honorable mr chief justice he recommended did a more see a future for the committee to be encouraged and eventually a project named as e codes.gov.in the website which has been launched in 2013 a project was uh, introduced for the project in uh, at this very moment we are under the phase 2 of that particular project in under the phase 1 uh, very few things were introduced like uh, the cis the case information system everybody every individual can see his case status every individual can see see his listings everything in the second phase which has just completed in the november 2019 in that phase we have uh, incorporated the njdg if anybody would have heard the two search uh, webinar he said use this term njdg there are national judicial data this is national judicial data grid where everything every data every special case every order and every judgment and mind my words every judgment and every order there are no cases undated today in the history of rajasthan judiciary similarly there is no case whose order has not been uploaded uploaded even in this pandemic time like if uh, i have heard almost 100 cases of, online in this pandemic and all my orders have been uploaded the same day but now i have to when i talk about like uh, this was a pandemic time and we were required to upload now what the uh, challenge we are going to face is the e procedure we all say that e filing should be done e virtual court should be established today it is not the scenario where we can uh, cope up with all the challenges at the same time we need to gradually shift we cannot shift abruptly on a at a very particular moment like if when we talk about when i talk about e procedure it means like we can file things on an electronic medium but we cannot justify things on an electronic medium like uh, the e courts like as honorable mr chandrachud sir said e courts are an alternative but they cannot replace the physical courts as this very moment because at this very moment everything is not defined everything needs to be changed we don't have proper internet systems we don't have that coped up law so the procedures needs to be changed the procedure needs to be identified and it needs to be introduced in a very different manner so with the advent of time also we need to take up the challenges see the, what is the difference is we are in an era of technology that is why we are discussing this today in 2020 we are discussing that the code should be digitalized in 2000 we were not even discussing about this topic so the time takes uh, change each change requires time and this we are at this very moment we are under the uh, hybridization i must say that we are not in the inter, actual internet uh, era and we are not actually on the physical era we are somewhere in the hybrid uh, era of that particular time and so we are in the form of transformation and this will take time it requires change in everything like uh, i uh, like for a very uh, simple example there are challenges had, had not challenges not had been there we would not have done a mock test of this webinar also yesterday am i right 
we did a mock because we had an uh, a doubt that it may not happen correctly tomorrow in courts it is not going to be like this that uh, we need to try one day and we will play it another day it is a hit and play at the same very moment so you cannot like ki action aaj bolte hain kal play karenge kal we will uh, play the movie it cannot be done there so for this we need to have a pack jam pack uh, system which cannot be uh, altered which cannot be hacked which cannot be differentiated and which cannot be challenged because uh, with chal- with some technology comes challenges and as soon as you allow people to come with technology hackers will also come with them if uh, some hacker transforms any documents and takes away any illegal benefit do we have a law even our cyber law is our cyber today cyber law but totally with the time is it coping up with the situation there are serious challenges so we need to discuss the ee procedure we need to uh, think about the current cyber law we need to dec- uh, discuss all the procedures. this is my view thank you nitin sir over to you thank you so much uh, mr pioneer for the clarity of uh, opinion which you brought to the subject uh, <clears throat> connecting to the uh, panelist uh, the last panelist with us uh, was uh, advocate nishant mishra so what's what's your opinion on the subject which we are discussing about today and what are the good sides you see to this uh, transition of uh, you know or the hybrid of the blending the terminology what mr pioneer was using that you know i mean and neither we are on this side neither we are on that side of the fence the hybrid model and the blended uh, model and it has progressed in phase of the entire digital system what's your overview and uh, what all goods do you see coming in the future ahead uh, thank you mr nathan and thank you vivekanand global university for inviting me for this webinar uh, first of all i would like to just uh, give an overview about the challenges which we are facing during uh, this pandemic and uh, with the e justice and e governance thing the first thing is, is that in india only 30 to 35% people are computer uh, computer literate so it's a big challenge for us that uh, in india sense only uh, uh, less than half of the population are uh, uh, computer literate so it's really very impractical that everything can be put on e governance or e courts second thing that if uh, we will start arguing and if we will start uh, doing everything through online courts that what will happen to the juniors and what will happen to the interns who used to visit uh, honorable courts honorable tribunals to learn how the young court members will learn how the young bar will uh, cope up with the challenges which uh, the older generation has already failed how they will learn basically the interns to <laughs> intern students the third thing i would like to tell is about the remote areas that still in india 70% population lives in the village and although every village is trying to be getting uh, developed but still the people are not so developed that they can use internet and they can use e code so frequently the internet facilities even in the best or the capital cities is not that good we find some uh, corners to get uh, best in, uh, internet facilities then uh recently we have seen that what happened in maharaj the cyclone came and it crashed the whole of the wires and networks so in a situation where such kind of a, a natural disaster comes or anything like that so in such a situation repairing of electronic medium is will take much more time than the physical courts next is that we still uh, fill physical forms in bar associations we still fill physical forms for judicial services and we are expecting that a uh, a person who is not even graduate the person who is not even studied for till primary school or primary government school he is uh, able to access such kind of webinars or access such kind of e court proceedings then uh, comes that e court does not mean e justice it's a, it is fine that we, we are, the procedure is electronically better it is swift but that does not mean that the judiciary will be able to give you justice at an electronic speed because obviously only the procedure is at the electronic speed but not the justice the court has to still examine all the evidences examine all the things and in electronic form it is hard even for the forensic labs and even for the various departments to examine the things for e governance and for e courts first we have to make our administration electronically uh, feasible electronically well developed electronically healthy even today the police officer used to write the hadith which is the application served by the informant we used to write an fir and then it is typed the charge sheet is now uh, it is available in the typed form but it is still not available on the internet so these are certain challenges and after that where every all the panelists uh, all the senior panelists are talking about that uh, uh, there is an opportunity for the cyber criminals to hack any kind of a website or hack any kind of that document we have to also see that how many tribunals we have in india that deals in with the cyber crimes 
even in the uh, in the very capital of india we lack number of judges and cyber tribunals so in such a scenario it is really hard for the right time or uh, it is really hard for this time that we can directly uh, come on e governance or e court today uh, government is trying to emphasize for uh, downloading the arogya setu app but even still the arogya setu application is not able to we uh, people are not able to understand the arogya setu app application as well which is a kind of a tool which can safeguard you from the pandemic and finally what is the good part obviously it's really really hard right now to tell what is what, what what can be the good parts of electronic governance or electronic uh, uh, court system because we have just entered into this scenario and furthermore what good can be done yes it will be served it will save your time you are not able you are uh, uh, not uh, worry to move out of your house you can do everything on your home but still india what i feel is not prepared for these things because we still are facing many challenges we still face uh, malnutrition people we still are a starving country and in such a situation it is really very really hard that we are not able to get data how we will get so much of data so this is what i would like to conclude with it thank you over to you mr nathan very interesting thing you said in the end that data and and data i mean uh... what can thank you we try to draw was absolutely interesting but then uh, you know th- this is certainly a challenge of course you know with the computer literacy being uh, so less in terms of percentage uh, we are yet to think about uh, uh, implementing the e court or the e judicial system completely in the system uh kicking off the discussion further and uh, coming back and connecting back to advocate sumit chandra sir yes Thank you. So, uh, so you are a senior expert of alternate dispute resolution. I would like to first be start by understanding, by letting audiences understand that what are the the challenges in the implementation of ADR in some of the courts and other talking about in ECOs. Uh, see, Nitin, let us first understand what is included in ADR. Now, section eighty nine of the Code of Civil Procedure. defines the adr system or the alternative dispute resolution mechanism so it talks about the settlement of disputes outside the court it says that where it appears to the court there that there exists said and refer them to four things one arbitration two conciliation Three judicial settlement, including settlement through local dialog, and last but not the least, mediation. Let us first talk and understand mediation, or in this case, what we call now the e-mediation. Now, I am myself a mediator with the Delhi High Court Mediation and Conciliation Center. The Delhi High Court Mediation Center has recently ventured to start this e-mediation program. It's still at a developing stage. Now there are certain important nuances to mediation. Let's understand that before we understand the concept of e-mediation. Now, so far as mediation is concerned, is concerned, one it should be a voluntary process. It should not be pressurized. The party should come on their own free will and wish. There should be a neutral third party who. Should be there to assist the parties in arriving at a mutual settlement. It is the parties who will arrive at a settlement. The third person sitting as a mediator is only to assist and help them arrive at that settlement. Third, the process should be a confidential process. This is a very important requirement. In fact, during the process of the mediation, the mediator may choose to take one of the parties in a caucus session. That means they can do a separate session with that one of the parties, obviously within the knowledge of the other party, and then discuss the things which that party may not want to disclose in the presence of the other. So these are confidential processes because the person is conveniently assured that whatever is being spoken there is only in the mediation process and is not going anywhere out of that room. Once the settlement is arrived at, a settlement deed is drawn and is presented after being signed by all the parties. 
their counsels and the mediator it is presented before the court for making it part of a decree and now what we are trying to do is follow this entire process through video conference but if we do that through video conferencing what problem we face first and foremost any part he may secretly record the session because it's being done through video conferencing so that recording may not hold any ground in the eyes of law but still the when we are talking about it being a confidential process we need to somehow keep a check on that like for example even the session as we talk is being recorded at the moment this is somewhere a challenge still to keep a process confidential without allowing any party to record this secondly when a settlement is arrived at and the settlement deed is drawn how do we take the consent of all the parties in the presence of the mediator as is a requirement for mediation of course we are finding the ways of doing that by taking the consent of uh, the parties and the councils on in these are small challenges and i am sure we will be able to overcome our courts our mediation centers are already working towards similarly the process needs to be adopted in conciliation and lok adalat settlements can be much similar as in mediation what we just discussed so far as the e mediation got the same problems will be faced there also arbitration of course is like a court here the parties mutually appoint a third person as an arbitrator who then conducts a complete trial of the case as it is in the court and then passes a judgment which is final and binding on all parties again what needs to be seen as what is the judgment of the law who who can it or how can it be accepted as an authenticated judgment now section 2 sub section 9 of the code of civil procedure defines a judgment and it states that it is a final decision of the court on the matter before it and is to be formally pronounced or delivered in open court but then what defines an open court in a video conferencing well then again there is order 20 rule 6b of the code of civil procedure which says that copy of the judgment shall be made available to the parties on payment of the fees immediately after the pronouncement how will you pay the fees how will you authenticate that the judgment which has been sent to you has been passed by the court or not been uh, amended or made any changes in that these are practical difficulties that needs to be looked upon and the government should come up with amendments in the procedural laws such as the code of civil procedure code of criminal procedure and the evidence act to incorporate the new ways of functioning of our judicial court through online methods keeping these things in mind this is the way forward and how it's going to evolve is still to be seen whether in the court of law or in the alternative dispute resolution process i hope that clarifies me definitely so i mean um, very clearly and very technically have you answered the question that was been put in on the uh, uh, the time times uh, coming ahead would uh, make us understand things with more clarity that how things would be implemented and how would be able to tackle say uh, coming to advocate tanvi uh, uh doctor uh, i mean advocate sumit was also talking about that uh, you know, uh, filing is is an important part of uh, the e procedure and filing is of course an important part of the e court system if we talk about uh, taking a more in depth and a more detailed uh, uh, version from your side that what basically is e filing all about and what are the do's and don'ts to be kept in mind Uh, right, right. Am I audible? Yes. So, there are certain crucial aspects about e-filing which I'll very briefly discuss. So, e-filing is totally a new concept as we all are talking about. So, everyone uh, is unaware that whatever we are gathering is through the procedures and the different circulars that are issued by the court. So, the steps that are followed by everyone during filing is through those circulars being issued by the court. specifically talking about the supreme court so they uh, this uh, 
they've, they've issued a clarification and an operating procedure that's on the supreme court website if i can also share a link here for the benefit of all i'll try and share the link here as well so uh, essentially the supreme court procedure the filing is open 24/7 for everyone there are certain important uh, things that have to be kept in mind while filing first of all is the court fee that has to be paid online digitalization of the signatures that is required in supreme court it's uh, as we all know the filings are done through aor so uh, the moment you enter now click on the supreme court website there you can see a particular segment for the online filing so if you register there, there will be an aor code that has been required so you can do the filing only through aor and your aor if uh, someone is personally aor then he will require or she will require that aor code so once you enter the code you have been logged into the actual page where you can start your filing i personally uh, you know uh, was involved uh, in filing couple of petitions during this uh, time period so it's, it's actually uh, the problems as you ask me problems that people are facing first is the scanning of documents because of course uh, this is very new to everyone i mean rather than we were quite used to filing of the petition manually but now the problem being faced by everyone is of course the scanning of the documents the payment of the court fee all of these things uh, are very clear in that manual and the procedure that is issued by the court so if someone has any query they can quickly go through that manual because it personally helped me also to clear many of my queries while i was also in that process so that is first secondly i think uh, it depends on the urgency of the matter so most of the hearings right now are perfunctory so if you have the urgency in the matter then your aor has to submit the mentioning application with there is a particular uh, email address to which the aor has to submit the mentioning application that mentioning application is like a one page or not more than one page which uh, involves or which explains the urgency of your matter to be heard before the court and that uh, apart from the urgency there is also a para under which the parties are giving consent for the video conferencing and also uh, there is an exemption uh, clause that is there in that application to file the affirmed affirmed affidavits so uh, that is one aspect so as soon as your petition is filed if there is an urgency there is this mentioning application then your matter is entertained within a week or so if there are defects of course the defect clearing is again one important hurdle that is People are facing. It's a very big hurdle that people are facing because you have to clear defects online. So, for example, if a document is not properly scanned, you have to again do that process. So, all of these things are to be kept in mind while uh, filing your petition. And I think uh, that will only come while people are experiencing this because uh, this is new for everyone. So, uh, yeah, so I think these uh, two three things people should come uh, take care of. I'll also try and share that link for the benefit of everyone who's joined us today, so that people can have uh, go through it while filing. It's very uh, beneficial for everyone. And for the young students, I feel that since they are all, uh, you know, uh, many of uh, the students may be in the final year, and they must be uh, in the process of you know placements and all. And uh, your, I mean, they are totally uncertain. I've been receiving many calls from the students that what to do now. we are not we are clueless what to where to enter and where to get placements and everyone is you know having the doubt but people should try and engage themselves in reading uh, and maybe writing articles writing blogs and also as far as the e filing is concerned you can also learn a lot from this procedure because uh, what we've been hearing is what people are saying that the unintended benefit of pandemic that is the digitalization of the courts that should be continued for uh, generations and for years to come so to learn about the filing procedure online i think this is the best time for even the law students to uh, benefit and uh, learn from this uh, process so nitin i think uh, these are certain pointers that i feel uh, people should take care while filing i i am and i hope this uh, addresses your concern Right, I'm, I'm sure this addresses the concern, and uh, you know, uh, here's the whole detailed overview to everyone in the audience. Is that what are the do's and don'ts and the important points to be kept in mind while the new procedure of e-filing? If this is new for everyone, uh, the, coming to Dr. Vijay, as uh, Advocate Tanvi was also talking about the students, and you know that that's what we have all gathered here for. And uh, the idea has also been conceptualized by our dear students. They've done the efforts day in and day out. 
uh, internship is, is also one thing uh, Advocate Tanvi was talking about. And of course, you know, followed to internship is the placement of these students. I would like to take your uh, take here that how important and what is the role internship have to play in these times, specifically when, uh, you know, uh, the so-called time of crisis and uh, transition is, is there. And, uh, you know, the things may be expected to change drastically in the coming future. So how students need to cope with the same and uh, what role of internship is to play here? Uh, thank you, Nitin. Um, uh, let me try to take uh, you back to, to the legal education when there was no five years legal education and only it was three years. So after having done the LLB degree, the students were not in a position to do anything in the court, not even in a position to write on a small application. So it was thought that when a lawyer, when a uh, an LLB uh, student completes LLB and goes to court, he should be able to do something like a doctor after having MBBS, he is able to do many things. So, internship was made compulsory for, by the Bar Council of India as a clinical paper. Three clinical papers are important ADR, boot court, and internship. In this, the students learn law in action. Whatever theory is being taught in the uh, universities and colleges, in the law departments, they try to see practical with some advocate, with some judge, or some lawyer, and uh, uh, or some in, in law form. So they are with some NGOs, so they try to learn the line action, how the law is working in practical fields, how some draftings are done, how court applications are filed, as the uh, advocate Tanvi was telling. So all the practical procedures are taught to them in the uh, internship. So internship is one of the most important component of learning, because of, uh, doing is learning. When they do these things, they learn it. And I, I feel that it's very, very, very important for the students and they must try to return uh, to the maximum time wherever they get. At this moment of time, we are having a little difficulty. But our students are returning with advocates and in law firms and they are being given some research work that is not as good as being uh, physically present with the lawyers or judges, but still they are having something to work. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, Nitinji, thank you. I think you are able to hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for letting students understand that uh, what is the role of internship to be played in these times and how they need to well adapt. And uh, coming back to uh, Mr. Parina Joshi, to what we were just discussing about, you know, when we initiated the concept of and the idea of to discuss internship, uh, we were talking about that what are the challenges and you know e procedures and e filings and e words like e governance and e codes. E codes. My question is, e -codes, will, will e codes ensure transparency and speed in judiciary proceedings? Thank you for the question. Yeah, definitely. If uh, with technology, there becomes very good advantages. Like if we involve technology, there will be transparency. Likewise, if I have to start from the basic, like if we talk about the subordinate code, a person who has to take a copy of a document of a court proceeding, he has to visit several places. He has he has, is made to roam to from place to place, and he has to. I should not say it officially, but unofficially, he has to compensate also with this roaming. Uh, this will reduce harassment, and this will enable him to do, get a document or a copy as soon as he applies for the state. This will reduce actually. This will reduce harassment, but and at the same time, it will include. Uh, it will enhance transparency. Similarly, as soon as whatever doc doc required document a person applies, he will play, pay for the document online only and he will get the copy for it. So no money is involved, which will again encourage transparency. Similarly, it will be for an, it will be an easy access to all. Like a person wants to access anything, his, uh, the status of his case, the proceedings of his case, any interim order, any application order, he can get it very soon without involving any other third person in the loop. Not even his advocate is required to be involved if he does not want anybody else to be involved. So again, less harassment will improve transparency. Similar with this, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, a court officer is required to upload the order on the very same day. So means like if there are uh, several allegations on the judicial system, like the people changes the dates, the files are kept undated, we, uh, the, they don't upload the orders. These challenges can be incorporated and can be answered uh, very easily and without any harassment. Like if uh, an order is done today and it, if it is uploaded by the end of today itself. 
there will be no complaints and it will obviously encourage transparency and eventually everybody all the stakeholders like the advocates like the judicial officers like the client they all will be encouraged to answer and address the problem of the client at the very same time similarly when he is also uh, and a judicial officer will be all uh, required to produce an order quantitatively as well as qualitatively he cannot compromise on quality because his order after 15 minutes of signature will be live that is will be on the on air so every he will also focus on it and it will be more transparent and he there will there will be no chances of any mismanagement any misinterpretation anything also uh, like when we involve technology any other medium like any other people advocates are obviously in stakeholders of the system but the agents and doubts are not and when we encourage uh, this technology the other the mis elements of this institution are uh, formally eliminated from this uh, this uh, chain and as soon as the unwanted elements are eliminated the this excess of justice goes very easy and becomes very transparent thank you over to you nitin Thank you, uh, Mr. Parina. Coming to advocate, Nishant, the uh, you know, e uh, e procedure is, is what we have talked about in our last conversation, and uh, so you have very categorically said that uh, we are in the phase of transition and we are adopting ourselves. Would this term or or would this transition or would this leveraging of uh, uh, tech as a tool in the Indian judicial system will help uh, to uh, let not uh, justice be delayed or deferred? A speedy uh, delivery of the justice. Fine. Uh, I have already said that the procedure is electronically at a good pace, but justice cannot be uh, at the same pace because in just in uh, just furnishing the justice, you are required to examine the evidence, examine the papers, examine the annexes. So justice delayed is justice denied, or delayed justice will still prevail because it is a part of, the, of a judicial system that you cannot uh, just give out. Judgment, like in haste. Practically speaking, there are very, very, very challenges in uh, applying the e-governance and e-court system. The first thing is that the young generation of lawyers will fail to learn, and they are required to adopt such kind of technologies and such kind of uh, 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 these systems so that they can learn. Second thing that at many point of time now, even today, when we are arguing on. Uh, this uh, video conferencing the clients are not able to face the court the clients are not able to see the uh, the court system the uh, the hearings which are being taken place through video conferencing in that condition the transparency level is not that good the third thing is this that uh, since some of the panelists are saying that it will be more transparent but even though the, what will happen to the clerks who are working in the court their the mere employment of those clerks will finish fourth thing that uh, uh, today in the in which era we are living today in, in india i don't think it is possible that we can completely shift on the e court or e governance because the computer literacy is low even some of the lawyers whether young lawyers or the old lawyers they are not very well versed with the technology they are not very well freaky with the technology and since uh, in the video conferencing thing what happens that a, a senior lawyer is allowed to have just one junior lawyer and in such a condition since in the physical courts you can see that every senior lawyer has uh, seven to eight juniors or there is no such limit but in practicality in the video conferencing thing only very few juniors will be able to learn and that is something which is not approachable from a common law intern or common law student then uh, since we are discussing about various sections of law various procedures so what happens that the procedural challenges can be meted out because that is something which is uh, made with the legislation and even in the high court rules or in the supreme court rules or in the lower court rules but the ma a major problem is this that what will happen to the people who are coming from rural india from bihar from uttar pradesh from telangana from andhra pradesh from south india instead of e courts or e mechanism we can have several benches of supreme court in india we can have a north bench we can have a south bench we can have east and west bench so that a person who is from uh, tamil nadu or the kanyakumari is not required to move to delhi to face a physical court and instead of that he can just uh, uh, go to his nearest branch or nearest bench 
where he can get the accessibility to the court. And uh, furthermore, what I can see that what challenges are still there is that the first thing is that the biggest problem is education and literacy. Even today, uh, recently what I can see that people who are very old age, who are farmers, peasants, they used to come to the courts and they used to just uh, press their uh, cloth at their forehead saying, Babu ji ho jayega na. They are so much uh, trustworthy towards the advocates. Since uh, one of our panelists has said that advocates are basically the stakeholders of the whole judicial system, I agree with that at some point. But even still, there are some other clerks, some other uh, employees, some other office bearers who are res responsible to help the, the uh, client who is not that aware, who is not able to uh, fetch such kind of judgments or such kind of orders. Then what challenges are there is this and what is the solution to this is that we can set up some of the uh, primary schools for uh, making some of the rooms so that those people who are not well versed with this kind of video conferencing, they can be called over there, they can be called on some booth, which can be created by the state governments or the central government or even by through some high court judgments or high court rules. We can have some of uh, uh, such kind of uh, centers where the clients can go and witness what is going on, that how his client or uh, how his advocate is really arguing in the court. Furthermore, uh, there have been instances with some of my uh, colleague lawyers as well that during such kind of video conferencing procedure, if uh, they are using Wi-Fi through electricity, that can switch off. And again, the whole buffering system will keep keep on going. And second thing that sometimes since you are not in, uh, you are a young lawyer, suppose I'm a very young lawyer, and if I'm uh, facing any video conferencing and the judge is uh, trying to uh, overpower me through his uh, arguments and I'm trying to overpower him through my arguments and we both are trying to prove each other, sometimes in the physical courts, the senior members of bar used to come to escape the young lawyer or used to tell him the etiquettes and manners of how you are required to present in the court. That will also not happen. And see, uh, see, uh, recently we can see that in a video conference session, uh, an advocate from Rajasthan just wear uh, that vest and came before con uh, video conferencing. Only a banyan. And we, that whole news was uh, pondered through many of the uh, web portals and many of the legal insights. So here are some things which uh, will lose. Then further the uh, the uh, interest and the trust and repo which people used to have in judiciary that will also be somewhere where it will lose because people will not be able to see the open courts and see the open court uh, uh, culture. Because if we uh, talk about the historical perspective of open courts, so open courts were uh, brought Oh, not only for the people that yes, uh, that the clients and the advocates can argue in open, but it was there so that everyone can hear what justice has been pronounced, what the honourable judges and what the honourable benches and what the honourable courts are pronouncing either in favour or in against the party, so that rest of the people can also hear. So this is something that even the public justice will come in a very small and very in a very private manner. The private dispute redressal mechanisms, we already have the ADR system, but the common general judicial system is not that private. Thank you. Right. Uh, so we are here with the stakeholders of the Indian judicial system and discussing on this virtual learning platform of Vekananda Global University the future trends of the and the transition of the judicial system of the country and what's in there, the avenues for the students in terms of the career possibilities. Uh, coming to uh, Advocate Sumit uh, back again. Sumit, sir. Evidences are the spine and the backbone of any, any procedure in law. Uh, so, wanting to understand from your side that what are the various methods uh, for the collection, uh, preservation, and investigation of digital evidence in the current time? <laughs> See, uh, the digital evidence arguments, the procedural part of it, you are very right. The, these are the questions which are to be actually thought about and discussed because this is the where the problem is actually now going to start. Uh, high Court, Supreme Court are mostly appellate courts. Very few high courts in the country are having the original jurisdiction. It is the trial courts that will face these kind of problems. 
See, I have had the opportunity to argue a case before the Delhi High Court during this lockdown period. It went well. But in this case, like I said, in the High Court, there was an application filed by the opposite side and a copy of the same was sent to me by me email well in advance. A date was fixed by the Honorable High Court and was informed to me through email. Me and the opposite counsel logged in to the link provided to us by the court at the time given to us and the hearing started. The advantages were that I could comfortably share a judgment immediately on email, put forward my arguments when the opposite counsel spoke when his turn came and submitted his argument. I agree to some extent that there were certain technical glitches such as the voice of the opposite counsel was getting cut in between. But these are manageable issues. In fact, a very creative way has been devised by the courts um, in a very recent judgment uh, where the Delhi High Court directed the parties to record the video clip of their oral agreements and submit a brief note of submissions along with you know that case of Satpal Soni versus Union of India. Very recent judgment of the Delhi High. So, clearly the courts are also devising new creative ways to go on with the proceedings. Now, particularly when we talk of the evidence. Well, Supreme Court has already interpreted Section 273 of the Criminal Procedure Court in the light of technological advancements. It said that recording of evidence through video conferencing would be perfectly legal. It was a case of PC singing. Now, our courts, you'll be surprised or possibly many of you are already aware that in many cases has already been using the technology of video conferencing to record the deposition of witnesses for quite some time now. Now, it would be for the first time that the video conferencing will be put to use more frequently for connecting the bench with the bar for majority or possible, possibly all the cases. So this is something which is now developing as a system. Now the evidence has to take place accordingly. Like I said earlier, the amendments need to take place in all the procedural laws, be it the CPC, CRPC or the Evidence Act. This amendments need to be done in consultation with the judiciary and the law department. The legislature has to bring up new laws that how you are actually going to make it happen, uh, what will be valid in the eyes of law, how the documentary or oral evidence are going to be recorded in the court. Uh, these are the amendments that we are still to be uh, looking for and uh, we are waiting for these amendments to be brought in by the legislature. I, I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for the detailed version uh, on the perspective we wanted to talk about. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, re reconnecting to the student side of the conversation, uh, we have Advocate Tanvi with us. Uh, hello. So, Advocate Tanvi, uh, you know, uh, reading uh, reading the brief of uh, your work, professional history, you know, uh, you've had a very uh, fortunate chance of uh, interning uh, with some of the uh, you know the, the most prominent faces of the law business of country. So, uh, you know, you have had a very interesting internship journey and then now, you know, in, in the, uh, I mean, of course, now when you're practicing, so, uh, that's a different side of the story altogether. Taking your perspective, uh, internship, uh, because, you know, uh, I, I've also read that you said that internship is also an experiment with trust and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's a mirror to a student's self. So, uh, what is your take about internship and, uh, you know, what would you want to advise to these students? Yeah, Thank you, Nitin. So, uh, I've been always uh, telling the students that uh, in order to polish your legal skills, something that's most important is internships. And, you know, I mean, uh, although this is a little deviation from the topic, but yes, I, I think it's very good on your part to bring this issue because uh, it's, it's very important for the younger generation to analyze what they have to do while in law school. So, all, uh, whether it's a three year law course or a five year law course, it's very important. I mean, practical. Knowledge is something that makes you closer to uh, the main area or the main goal that you have in life. So whether it's, whether you're going to be uh, in, enter into litigation or whether it's corporate or whether it's judiciary, all of that will be dependent on the practical exposure and experience. It's be conclusive on taking any decision as to what area you have to adopt only while you have experienced it practically. 
and the best way to experience is apart from mood boards and other uh, activities that the association round the mood boards all of that is essential but internship i think the college provides for two to two internships a year that helps you immensely in understanding not even the basic principles of law but also its applicability because once you are in the ground once you see how the filing is done once you see how a briefing is done once you see how you build a case out of the scratch all of that is only possible while you are in the process so an internship the one more important thing that uh, i would like to tell the students is that it's very important to choose the internships wisely it's very very important because uh, and there has to be a strategy so if you are in a five year course you have to decide okay i have to start with a trial court internship you can't directly jump to the apex course because there you will be lost you need to understand first the trial court principles you need to go to the high court and then only you can climb the ladder and gradually go to the apex court level to intern and i mean believe me you this i have experienced myself that while you have two three internships or in your experience you tend to understand the interest area that what's my interest area whether i'm liking litigation or not whether i'm liking corporate whether i want to go to a law firm whether i want to uh, go to uh, and work in a chamber so all of that will happen once you are in the process once you are having that experience so i my uh, advice to all of the students who joined us for today's session is that go you should must and must uh, in turn and go for internships as many internships as possible but yes uh, having uh, you know uh, seeing this i also need to put a caveat that please please build a strategy a strategy is very important when to intern where to intern and which year to intern if you are in a final year and you've not intern anywhere then it will be like a it's never too late it uh, uh, it's rightly said but it will be a situation where you will be lost so you have to in start your internship from the very first year gradually climb the ladder gradually devise your interest areas and you know uh, every internship teach you a lesson and you the kind of circle you develop in the law school even while you graduate so the uh imagine a situation the day of your enrollment a client comes and gives you a brief that okay i want you to be my lawyer so you need to understand you will already be prepared because you know what happens in the court what happens in the ground so yes uh, of course uh, it is a very important tool and it helps you enhance your legal skills but uh, deciding uh, and taking the right decision at the right time is very very important in this five year law journey that uh, and deciding and applying well in advance all of these things are very important for uh, choosing internships yeah nitin you over to you right may rightly said that a strategic approach is is must and very important for these students to identify the how and what to step in and then eventually they can uh, uh, definitely uh, make a step forward towards the career path as well Uh, connecting this uh, to uh, Dr. Vijay, uh, Dr. Vijay, you are a part of Academy and a very senior professor, one of the reputed law universities of the country. Now, your observation in this time of crisis during this pandemic lockdown, changes occurred. You know, I mean, uh, 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 practical subjects like law, but you know, altogether, how do you see the future? I mean, any kind of transition, any kind of amendments to be made? What's your take on that? Nitin, can you please repeat your question because I could not hear you properly. Uh, so we have just talked about internship, and we have taken your perspective as well on the internship. You are from the academy, and of course, senior professor in the reputed uh, law school. Uh, it's a time of crisis wherein we have seen a lot of changes being happening in uh, in the pedagogy, basically. Uh, one one of the other subjects, law being such a practical subject. What have been the the differences or the or the challenges that have occurred so far, and how can we keep going forward? Are there amendments to be taken in the entire system of education to come to the perspective? Then, uh, so far as teaching of law is concerned, uh, this lockdown period can be, and this online teaching can be a stopgap gap arrangement. It cannot be a permanent solution. Because as the previous speakers and others have said, that when we are teaching, actually communication is a reflection back also. When a teacher is teaching uh, in a classroom, he sees the faces of the students and finds out whether they are able to understand him or not. Even if the student is not telling, 
the teacher makes it that he is not able to understand and then he tries to explain in a different manner. Then he questions, class questions and students also question. But on the internet mode, it's sometimes impossible because sometimes teacher is speaking and the internet at his end is not working, the students are not, the students are not able to hear. Sometimes teacher is speaking, his internet is working, but the internet of some student is not working. So there is a lot of gap in between. So virtual teaching is just a stopgap argument. And it cannot be replaced by the physical classroom teaching. And hence, as soon as the situation improves, the classroom teaching must begin. Because it is much more than the virtual teaching. Over to Unity. Over to you, Nitin. Thank you. Thank you, students, for understanding that. How have we been able to cope up and how have we been able to adapt to the circumstances and the, what are the future possibilities? Coming to Mr. Paranar Joshi back again. So, Mr. was also talking about amendments, you know, possibilities of amendments in the entire system. So, leveraging digital would come with a cost as well. You know, I mean, economic cost is what specifically we are talking about here. So what, what, what is your perspective on this? What are the requirements, uh, you know, I mean, uh, required changes that are to be brought about uh, to leverage digital in the system from the very uh, you know, lower base level to the very upper base level? Uh, as far as cost is concerned, my personal opinion on this particular point is that cost will be compared. We need to be here and we need to pay at that end. Like right? means what I meant to say is we need to save at this physical end to pay at the online medium. But with the advent of time, we, when we will be expertise in, uh, in this particular field and when the technology will be all together available in all possible mediums, then it will be like we will be uh, saving from here and saving everywhere because with technology we can save money and this is an uh, a widely accepted term. Like if I have to quote an example. Like we have a concept of alternative dispute resolution in India, we have this concept in foreign countries as well. But in the foreign countries, like Tanvi Ji quoted some time back, we have an online dispute resolution also. And in India also, we are partially working on, we are having a concept of virtual code. Uh, whereby uh, the traffic codes are made virtual where you don't need to go, you need to pay the fine and your concern, whatever document or whichever thing is seized will be returned accordingly. You don't need to go anywhere personally and physically. This involves le uh, a less amount of cost. Cost is cutted everywhere. Like if you go from one place to another, you, uh, cost will be involved. Similarly, if you engage a lawyer, cost will be involved. If you engage three more doubts, like in the terms of traffic things, I, uh, I must say, like other people are also involved in this, uh, many, uh, many more Unwanted elements are involved in this picture. So uh, much more amount of cost is involved. But as soon as we indulge technology, cost has been taken away. As far as staff is concerned, have that they are not trained, like, uh, train, uh, trained like the old staff, the senior staff, they are not trained. They can be trained. And hiring a new staff and training them is a very idiotic concept in compared to training an existing staff. And if we train a staff who is all Already existing will, will require a very uh, nominal amount of cost as compared to the other side. Thirdly, as the new recruits, as the, like we are hiring the new staffs, whenever the new uh, people we are hiring for the code procedures, a mandatory requirement, a mandatory eligibility criteria can be added. Like they need to be technically admitted. And this will sort out the purpose. Like without any incorporate impartation from our side, we will be able to manage the thing. And very less cost will be involved. With the advent of time when we all will be on the very higher level of expertise, uh, no cost will be involved. I suppose like uh, with the advent of time since, uh, if I look back in, this, uh, in the starting of the century 2000, year 2000, there was no cell phones. With the end of that decade 2010, there were less amount of cell phones and nobody used to know what a social media is. means. Even WhatsApp was not properly there. In By the end of this, uh, this decade, 2020, we are talking on WebEx, means WhatsApp is very common. My parents, my father, my mother, who are very old, they don't uh, knew what the phone is. And today they are very easily uh, texting everybody on WhatsApp, sharing digital things, sharing everything, looking at uh, recipes on YouTube, uh, say, calling their relatives on video calls. This was a very unwanted, uh, uh, unexpected scenario, right? Like if you had, we cannot, we had not even imagined a video call. 
in way back in 20 way back 20 years but today we are doing it and no cost is involved uh, apart from data similarly if we look look 20 years from now no cost will be involved and the cost whichever will be utilized in this 20 years will be compensated from in the coming years that's my view thank you nitin ji thank you for a very descriptive very clearly saying that if we cut an ear we save an ear and we put in somewhere else and that's the idea basically uh, coming to advocate nishan of uh, the question is uh, what step the court may take to ensure access <coughs> by the public to remote hearings that have been held in private perfect question uh, the first thing which i have already said that uh, the courts can have booths they can have centers so that people from remote areas can attend the court proceedings and can attend the court hearings and uh, the honorable courts can appoint court officers in the, there even in the remote areas because every remote area also have that district court so if any person who is uh, uh, not able to travel to the high courts or to the supreme court can attend the court proceeding in his own district through the centers or through the booths we can give uh, that booths any name suppose e court booth or e e court center so this is something which the honorable courts can do second thing that uh, in the present scenario there are courts there are district courts which even lack proper staffing they don't have proper typewriter uh, sorry typists they don't have stenos they don't have bench uh, secretaries and in such a scenario in the rural areas the honorable judges themselves have to write the judgments and they themselves have to upload it on the websites so we still lack many other things we still lack staff and due to staffing a problem the justice is also delayed so we can uh, think over that also then when we uh, qualify for any judicial services we uh, we are not required to know the uh, local language we do not we are not required to know the typing in local language so in that condition obviously we are required to hire the staffing hire the staff and hire personnel so that people can understand the judgment in their own way further thing is this that since the literacy rate is also not that good in india although uh, 75% of indians are literate but what is the definition of literacy in mhrd it says that if a person is above 7 years of age and if he can write his or her name then he he is a literate person which is totally unmatched with the definition of literacy what unesco says but still uh, if we can able to just uh, create some audible sections or some audible softwares so that if a person is not able to read the judgment he can hear the judgment this is how uh, electronic governance or electronic courts can work and some of the challenges can be curbed furthermore uh, look what happens that a litigant can be of any age any gender any uh, from anywhere so we are required to think over that also that a person or a child who is uh, of 7 years 8 years 10 years of age and he has suffered some of a some of crime some of victim uh, victimization that in that condition how he will be able to uh, attend such kind of court proceedings if he has not his if he if he uh, don't have any guardian or he is homeless or something like that i have fought cases for child prostitutes now just imagine what is the condition of child prostitutes where their own father and, and their own brothers used to uh, 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 make the, the girl lose uh, her virginity I, in such a situation how he, uh, she can just uh, come to me or how she can approach the honorable courts through electronic mediums furthermore that even if uh, some advocates can uh, advocate for in favor or in again against the uh, this electronic medium but still there is a lack of a bridge between the litigant and the advocate because the litigant is not able to converse converse with the advocate electronically because what happens is that a litigant always want to meet his lawyer and always whenever he calls a lawyer he says ki bhai sahab aap khali hain to hum aa jaye if you are free so that i can come to you and i can just show you some of the papers because he also want to see the physical office of uh, the lawyer he want to see that yes my lawyer is not a robot which every time google used to ask so this is something which is challenging but yes with a uh, time span and with some good innovative ideas and obviously we will be requiring some of the law, law young law students 
to research and develop the concept of e-governance and e-code. The uh, governments should uh, incorporate this policy also that they should hire uh, young lawyers and young interns uh, in the, the form of apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeship so that uh, such kind of new innovations can be brought into the policy making. So this is how things can be curbed. But still, I would say that it's really, really challenging that in the present scenario, we opt the e-governance and e-code policy. Thank you uh, for that detailed version, Nathuk and Deshaun. Uh, bringing us to the next phase of the discussion, then we'll take in some live questions coming up from the audiences. Uh, firstly, with the due permission of the panelists, uh, shall we move down to the next phase of this discussion? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, starting off with the uh, advocate, Sumit. So the first question which is coming up is, uh, so uh, e-filing is, is what basically the uh, the question I want to understand that what are the challenges, what are the technicalities and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, does it delay e-filing uh, coming up? The timeliness of filing, e-filing. Your voice was cracking in between, Nitin. Can you please repeat the question? Uh, so the question is uh, the process and the procedure of e-filing. So, uh, because there are technicalities and then there are challenges as well, there are shortcomings and then, there, you know, the, due to any kind of limitation of technology, uh, does it uh, delay the timeliness of e-filing and uh, if so, what are the, what are the uh, you know, what are your suggestions to cope with? Yeah, I'd, I'd already explained uh, the limitations. The courts have the power to condone the delay. You can move an application under Section 5 of the Limitation Act to condone the delay. Now, but that's that's in certain cases. I don't know which particular case you're talking about. But say, for example, an appeal is to be filed maybe in 30 days period, and you are not able to file it, or the filing has uh, been not been able to be done because of the email not working or the computer not working. You and you you call it a sufficient cause because the the provisions of Article 5 of the Limitation Act clearly says that. If the court is satisfied that there was a sufficient cause for not preferring the appeal or making the application within such a period, then the prescribed period can be condoned. The, uh, the delay can be condoned. Now, the sufficient cause, how do you define it, is yet to be seen. Possibly the courts in various judgments will define it in future. But uh, yes, there is a way to overcome this by filing a condemnation of delay application. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question, uh, which is coming up. Uh, so I would, uh, I would want uh, Advocate Tanvi to take that question, and then uh, eventually uh, Dr. Vijay to also contribute to answering of that question. So uh, education of future lawyers are truly affected. So how post pandemic they need to learn and deal with this? G. Uh, you need to unmute, please. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, yes. I'm So I, I, uh, I feel that it's a good question and a very relevant question uh, in the current situation. So the primary step, I think, for a young lawyer uh, in these current times is to understand the system because it's a new system for everyone. To be updated with the circulars every day, we see a new circular and a new uh, upgradation by different codes. So we up remain updated, and there is no uh, embargo uh, in turning or having a practical experience as such. So uh, in all of these, this is like a good time to have practical experience and practical exposure, so they can uh, utilize this time and uh, uh, these lockdown days to read and to analyze law, maybe learn, different, involve themselves in different skills. So, uh, yes, I think uh, this is the best way. This, uh, I mean, if time permits, then of course they can uh, learn the practical exposure as far as the reading of the briefs is concerned, as far as the drafting is concerned. Obviously, they can't go to the court where everything is shut right now. But uh, whatever is in our hand, they can make the best uh, utilization of uh, everything right now. Future, of course, no one knows. Uh, how much time this is going to take uh, for the things to normalize. I think Sir will be this or will add more to this. But uh, personally, I feel that uh, uh, a lawyer has to be updated. He has to read a lot and maybe engage themselves in writing. That's also a big aspect that 
uh, people can utilize this time in the lockdown days. Uh, thank you, uh, Advocate Tanvi. You are such a bright advocate that after your reply, there is nothing left for me to reply. But yes, uh, this uh, COVID-19 has brought in a situation where we will have to be prepared for any type of contingencies which might occur in future. This may be repeated or some new problem has come. So, the strength of other should not be outpulled like we are not able to use the computers in a very smart manner. So, the strength must be in a position in a very bright manner, the computers, the resources, and they should be prepared for any, any eventual come up in the future times. Uh, as uh, Tanvi has rightly said, they must be a great research. They are drafting the predictions in the universities. They should be a research critical in legal education, where including extra should be started in university level. In MOOC court, in MOOC court, also we should try to start e-filing, etc. as a practical course. And Is, uh, again connected to the academia uh, portion that uh, what resources should students take advantage of and focus on in the duration of their internship the question is for advocate the shot uh, mr Nathan, can you just repeat the question definitely what resources should students take advantage of and focus on in the duration of their internship okay fine so uh, basically the best resource for any guidance or for any knowledge is the books. Uh, comparatively, if we talk about the legal internships, so the best thing is to read and go through the bare acts and go through the AIRs and go through the case laws. Furthermore, the person under whom you are doing the internship, you should understand what he is trying to uh, make you learn because you are not for the purpose of some academic learning, but uh, instead you, you are there to learn some practical aspects of what you have learned in your academic premises. Then the files, the uh, things which are there in the chamber, you should also see the arrangement of the chamber that how your senior chamber is arranged because these are the things which are responsible to create trust and rapport in the mind and in the heart of the client. Because if you are not getting the clients and if you have very good knowledge, then too, you are not a good lawyer because you are not getting good clients. Because only the clients are able to make you a lawyer from a basic academician or from a basic law student. So this is what are the basic things which are required. Then you can go through the webinars, you can uh, you should attend seminars, you should uh, look into the libraries, law libraries. You can go to the bar libraries, you can see the recent local judgments. Now, suppose we, I'm from Lucknow, so you can go through 
the Lucknow case diary. And if you are uh, thinking or you are trying that you should specialize in some of uh, uh, very specialized uh, streams, suppose in Herrera or suppose in taxation or especially in the service matter or you are focusing only to go in the family disputes or in corporate sector, then start reading books, start reading journals, start reading, uh, reading uh, good websites which will give you good knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for those points, Advocate uh, I just wanted to add one more point. Uh, Nisanti has rightly said and he has covered almost everything. But I just wanted to tell the students that they should depend more on the primary source of information. The secondary source of information is to develop their critical thinking. But I have seen that whenever we are judging the mode course, the student try to see the secondary source and land up in the, um, uh, quoting a wrong precedence. So they must try to make a habit that for critical thinking, all secondary sources are very, very important, like comments, articles, books. But for understanding the clear law, they must base their knowledge on the primary source of data. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, the primary source of information is the most important. And of course, sir, as Advocate Nishant have also said that being a good observer would certainly contribute to be a good uh, professional lawyer as well when it comes to a student internship uh, tenure. Uh, taking the conversation forward and uh, letting the questions of the audiences to be taken directly by the panelists, the next question is coming up for uh, Advocate Parana Joshi. The question is, uh, I'll just read out this question. How e-codes will ensure transparency in judiciary proceedings? Uh, as far as I am concerned, I guess I have answered this transparency issue uh, way back. Still, I'll repeat my answer. Transparency will be encouraged. Like if every document and everything, like if we involve less amount of human intervention more amount of integrity and transparency is encouraged eventually like if we don't allow um, n number of people to intervene in the procedure like suppose i am a client whose civil dispute is linked uh, needs to be uh, engaged in the court i will first go to some known person because i am uneducated i'll go to some educated person he will take me to a lawyer then he, that lawyer will take me to a deed writer he, they will read the things there then they will take me to some other to need some copies of the document then they will take to someone else in then eventually they will file then uh, that matter will be listed in the court all whole amount of n number of people will be indulged in this but if we involve uh, technology in this the, the next part like uh, when once an advocate has been has been engaged the other all the terminologies all the other stakeholders are not required to be involved once you engage an advocate that advocate will do all the needful through the technique mode of technology so the harassment of that particular individual will be neglified similarly as soon as the other n number of people are not involved all the, uh, the stakeholders are will be required to uh, do their work without any intervention and with more amount of transparency. That is, is my point. Indeed. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Parina Joshi. Uh, uh, that, that brings us to the end of the uh, Q&A as well because we have limitations of the timing and uh, certainly our panelists also have their prior occupancy, so we would not for this question to give a time limit. Uh, it was a very wonderful and a very thoughtful discussion, bringing alongside the important points of the current system and you know, how we'll be leaping in the, the future of the judicial system. The transition is what we talked about from the student perspective and of course from the professional perspective and you know the, the perspective of the stakeholders is what we took along in the discussion. Uh, in the last phase, I would like to uh, heartfully thank all the panelists for joining us. Here and I'll request my team to help me present the key momentum on behalf of university to all the panelists. But you'll have to courier that. So that will certainly be sent through an email as well, and uh, you know, would be more than a pleasure to present it here on this open platform where there are thousands watching us live. Uh, would be absolutely a delight to share that as a token of gratitude.
for all of you uh, to make time from your busy schedule and being a part of the show, enlightening these students and of course everyone in the audience. This is this again a very interesting concept that team have come up with. Uh, they have been, uh, you know, doing a lot of webinars uh, in these lockdown phase and ensuring that there's no lockdown and vacation. And this is the little we can do to say our thanks and uh, lend our gratitude to the experts who are always helpful to join us from along, I mean, different parts. So thank you so much, Dr. Vijay, uh, for joining us. It was a pleasure uh, having your thoughts on the subject. Absolutely a delight. Thank you so much for joining us. Sir. Please so accept this on behalf of Vekananda Global University uh, School of Law. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Yes, uh, Advocate uh, Sumit Chandra sir, sir, it was absolutely a delight to have your thoughts, your opinion. And uh, I mean, what, what a pleasure was it. Thank you so much for joining us, taking time and being with us and making this panel an absolute star star channel. Thank you so much, sir. Please accept this on behalf of the Law School of Vekananda Global University. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Advocate Tanvi Dube, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for joining us. It was absolutely uh, wonderful to have you on the panel and uh, discuss this very thoughtful subject and let everyone in the audience just benefit out of your opinion. Thank, thank you so much you. on behalf of Vekananda Global University. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. Thanks a lot. It was really great to join with so good delegates and it was really, very really great to get moderated by you, Mr. Nathan. Thank you so much. Next, I would request Mr. Paparina Joshi to accept this e-momento as a token of gratitude from the School of Law of the Global University. And it's most thanks for joining us in this panel and discussing this thoughtful subject of e-governance and e-courts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathanji. And thank you, Vivekanand Global University, Jaipur, your team. Thanks to my co-panelists and thanks to all the students for bearing us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It was a delight for all these students and I'm sure they have all uh, must have learned a lot from this. Requesting everyone who is there with us on this uh, platform to switch on their camera so we can capture the screen. So webinar selfie is what we call this. So this they should not be missed, of course, to keep in the memories of this wonderful panel who was there with us on this uh, wonderful evening. And this is it's the good that have come out of this uh, virtual platform. The people from across, uh, you know, different uh, different cities across borders can come alongside and share across the thoughts. The best benefit of each student. Thank you so much to our panelists. What a pleasure was it to have you all. At most gratitude, at most thanks from Vivekananda Global University. We are signing off for day one. Uh, stay tuned to all the audiences. We have day two and day three coming up for this week on day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Tanvi ji. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. So much, sir. Thank you. Hi, Parnay. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. Hi, Nishant. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you once again. Bye. Take care, everyone.